There is almost endless complexity in the global food system. Tonight, we're zooming in on the issue of protein. Let's have a look at this. It's estimated that by the year 2050, there will be more than 9 billion people on the planet, which means that by 2050, we need to figure out how to feed an extra 2 billion people. According to National Geographic, although many of us consume meat, dairy, and eggs from animals raised on feedlots, only a fraction of the calories in feed given to livestock make their way into the meat and milk that we consume. For every 100 calories of grain we feed animals, we get only about 40 new calories of milk, 22 calories of eggs, 12 of chicken, 10 of pork, or 3 of beef. Why is this a problem? Because developing countries are now demanding more meat-rich diets along with their growing prosperity. To feed the world, the amount of protein it requires over the next 20 years is going to mean some significant changes in farming practices and probably in people's consumption habits as well. Okay, let's get into this. Joining us now for a look at the future of protein. In Calgary, Alberta, Fawn Jackson, Executive Director, Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. In Washington, D.C., Bruce Friedrich, Executive Director of the Good Food Institute. And here in our studio, Goretti Diaz, Professor in the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development at the University of Waterloo. Ben Boyer, Professor in the Department of Food Science at the University of Guelph. And also from the University of Guelph, Mike Von Masso, professor in the Department of Food, Agriculture, and Resource Economics. And it's great to have everybody both here in the studio and in Points Beyond on our program for this discussion about protein. I want to, uh, Bruce, and going to you first, I want to repeat the last line of that little setup pack there and find out what your view is on that. To feed the world the amount of protein it will require over the next 20 years is going to mean significant changes in farming practices and likely people's consumption habits as well. Agree or disagree? I uh, totally agree, Steve. And I think your setup laid it out perfectly. We're going to have a very difficult time feeding more than 9 billion people by 2050 if we're continuing to use a system that is so grossly inefficient as growing crops to feed them to animals so that we can eat the animals. Last year at the Milken Global Summit, Eric Schmidt, the chair of the board of Alphabet, parent company of Google, he was asked to reflect on six things that he thought would improve life for humanity in the fairly near future. And being the parent company of Google, being a tech guy, he talked about five things that you would expect him to talk about. But the first thing that he talked about was plant-based meat. He called it nerds over cattle. And he talked about plant-based meat because if you put one calorie of plant-based meat into plant-based meat, you get one calorie back out. If you put 10 calories into a chicken, you get one calorie back out. 15 calories into a pig, you get one calorie back out. It's a grossly inefficient system and all of those inefficiencies also lead up to an environmental nightmare, including about 40% more climate change than all forms of transportation combined. Okay, so lots if to we're unpack going to here. feed the developing world, we need a much better system. Lots to unpack there, Bruce, as we will over the next 40 minutes or so. Fawn Jackson, why don't you come in on that? What's your view on the last line of that setup pack? Yeah, I think that as we go forward and we need to produce more food for our growing world population, we're certainly going to see the need for uh, the agriculture system to evolve. I think one of the um, things in the opening that was alluded to was just how complex the agriculture system is here within Canada, but also globally. And so when we're looking at what a sustainable agriculture landscape looks like, we have to be very careful uh, to ensure that we're not oversimplifying that, to make sure that we're not looking at one golden um, solution to it. So something that I encourage people to do is to think about what does a sustainable agriculture landscape look like in different regions of the world. So here in Western Canada, just as an example, uh, we see if you're flying over and you uh, look out the plane window, you see uh, canola next to barley, next to hay, next to pasture land. And it's because all of those different uh, systems are working very well together in an integrated manner. So manure from livestock are used. Um, cattle um, eat the dried distiller's grain aside a byproduct of canola. They're able to eat other byproducts of crops that perhaps didn't make it into um, the food uh, 
supply chain because of quality reasons. So, you know, barley that we're producing, that we're trying to produce for uh, beer, doesn't always make it into that type of a quality. So we're able to use it in livestock systems. So I just really encourage um, us all to try and understand the complexity of the agriculture system and um, to, to really try and work towards a healthy agricultural landscape um, is, I think, a challenge that we're all going to be faced with as we're working towards feeding 9 billion people. Goretti Diaz, I want to get your take on the changes in farming practices and or people's consumption habits that the setup pack suggested was required over the next couple of decades to make it all work out. What do you say? Well, I agree with Fawn and Bruce. Uh, I think uh, there's going to be some substantial changes that need to be made. We know that right now uh, there's certain parts, uh, the planetary boundaries or limits that we can uh, we can't exceed in order for us to be able to survive, and our agricultural system is pushing those boundaries quite a bit. Uh, the current protein supply globally is made up of about 80% animal protein, so only 20% vegetable protein, and 50% of that is red meat. And uh, we need to do something about that ratio. I think we need to almost invert it, and that's the analysis that we've uh, done and other people have done, are saying that we probably need to have about between 50 and 70%. Pro, uh, plant, plant protein in yeah. order to be able to reverse some of the damage that we've done environmentally. But I think there's still going to be a place for meat. Uh, as Vaughn mentioned, there are certain systems where meat works really well, but we just have to reduce that amount. Ben Boyer, what do you say? Yeah, I agree with, uh, with a lot of the th previous things that have been said, but I, I also think that we need to, uh, to fully mention all of the valuable nutrients and minerals and vitamins that, that meat provides that we're not able to get from plant-based sources or not able to get as, efficient, as efficiently from plant-based sources. And from a food scientist's perspective, I, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all one type of a system that would replace meat with plant-based protein. I think that uh, every particular industry uh, has certain attributes that are valuable, and it's something, uh, something that we need to all work together to, uh, to make a more sustainable food source and, and like we mentioned previously, some uh, production systems and some crops uh, animals are able to utilize that we're not able to utilize a, a, as people. Those would be grasses, byproducts, all of those type of things that Fawn mentioned earlier. And I think that's something that, uh, that, that, that we need to be able to, uh, to realize and, and really uh, th and view it as a, 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 not a, a one-size-fits-all type of a system, but really uh, there's certain attributes that every system can provide. Mike, you take the last word on this first go-around. On the first go-around, I'll take the last word. I think what we've heard generally is, uh, yes, we're going to see some changes. Uh, yes, there are some advantages. And, and you know, while, while we may have some disagreements as how we get there, I think without a doubt there are going to be some changes. There is a future for meat. Um, we will run into boundaries as to how much meat we can produce. I think uh, maybe one thing we haven't talked about, we talked a little bit about changing farming practices. One of my personal pet peeves is, is, is how much food we lose through the system, how much food is thrown out. And, and if we spend some time thinking about that, there are some estimates that we waste as much as 40% of, of the food we produced. My guess is that's a little bit high. Uh, but there are a number of ways that we can go about uh, ensuring that we meet the nutrition requirements of the growing world population. Fun, I'm going to follow up with you and, and have you tell us the way farming practices have changed, let's just say over the last 50 years or so, how much better slash more efficient, more progress has been made over that period of time in your view? Yeah, I think there's been huge strides that have been made in agriculture efficiencies and uh, production gains. So just an example that I know off the top of my head is um, in the 1980s, um, to produce the same amount of beef that we did today, we used 25% uh, more breeding stock, or about 30% more breeding stock, and about 25% more land. So we've made really impressive strides uh, in Canada and worldwide uh, in our agriculture systems. Uh, certainly 
certainly we're going to have to continue to make those um, those improvements as we're working towards um, feeding nine billion people and I think that that challenge is has never been greater so we're certainly not going to be able to expand agricultural land and in fact we're losing it at quite an alarming rate so uh, here in Canada in the last agriculture census between 2006 and 2011 we lost um, you know more than I think about 6.8 million acres of agricultural land um, in Ontario only 5% of uh, land is is good agricultural land or is agricultural land and only about 0.5% is good agricultural land uh, so we really need to be making sure um, that we're making improvements within our new realities I think there's opportunity within Canada to make further improvements in our agriculture systems um, but we also need to be looking around the globe to make sure that we're not losing agricultural land to for example city expansion that we're not losing good quality agricultural land to things such as um, degradation we need to be looking at food waste we need to be looking at the yield gap between countries um, that are highly efficient and countries that are are not as efficient so I, I think that this is a, a very significant challenge um, okay but, let me jump uh, in here and follow up with Ben I'm gonna follow up with Ben here if if let me take the first part of what fun had to say which is efficiencies productivity gains smarter ways of doing business uh, have sort of managed to get us to where we are today over the last 50 years why should we not assume that employing those techniques over the next 50 years will get us where we need to go yeah and I think that's something that's really uh, pertinent to today's topic is that we're able to use technologies and livestock production to help improve efficiency if we look at the past uh, past half century or past 50 years we are much more efficient in producing beef pork poultry all of our meat products and even today if we look at how more how much more efficient we are in North America compared to places like South America or even China uh, I think some of the numbers would indicate that we are much much more efficient uh, one particular example is that uh, in North America in the US and Canada combined we're able to produce over twice as much beef in comparison to Brazil with half as many cows. Hmm. Okay, let me put that let me put that to Bruce. If if efficiencies and improvements in productivity have taken us this far, why do we assume that it won't take us the next distance we have to go? Well, I mean, animals are physiological beings. So I weigh about 180 pounds and I consume about 2000 calories a day and I don't gain weight. The introduction to this piece pointed out that even now, with all of those efficiencies, it takes about nine calories into a chicken to get one calorie back out, 15 calories into a pig, 25 calories into a cow. So you can only push the bounds of physiology so far. I think Fawn's point was really good. There is a limited amount of good agricultural land. Right now, the vast majority of that land is being used to produce crops to feed them to farm animals in this vastly inefficient system. If we're gonna feed nine billion people by 2050, we're going to have to move away from that. And all of that extra production produces a huge greenhouse gas. Um, I mean, it's just incredible. The United Nations, the Food and Agriculture Organization, produced a more than 400 page report and they found that animal agriculture is responsible for about 40% more climate change than all forms of transportation combined. So if we're gonna feed the world no, and we're gonna I, do I it without a massive are... greenhouse gas impact, it, we really need to change the system that we're using. Michael wants to respond. Yeah, one point I would make, and, and I think it's important to remember that, that not all agricultural land is created equally. And so there are some, uh, uh, there, there is some agricultural land that is particularly well suited for raising forage or raising fiber. And, and, and in fact, we'd probably be doing ourselves a disservice if we took it out of forage production and put it into grain production. So it uh, gets back to the, a bit to the complexity. There is some of our agricultural land base that is particularly good at growing grass and, and shouldn't probably be doing much else. And so, uh, while we do have a limited resource uh, and we are losing that resource, particularly in Ontario, we have to remember that it's not all identical and that, that the productive capacity is different and that we should think about 
in some cases, this land is particularly well suited for livestock. Having said that, I'm sensing a difference of opinion coming here on the environmental impact of agricultural, particularly animal agricultural practices nowadays. Uh, Fawn, I'm going to give you a chance in a second, but Goretti, I want you to come in first and talk about, in your view, the impact that animal agriculture has in contributing to climate change in the world today. I think there's uh, some range of numbers that have been given on the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with livestock, and I think Fawn is probably uh, disagreeing with Bruce's numbers, because if it was from the UN uh, uh, report on livestock's long shadow, they've now admitted that they didn't properly account for the transportation emissions. But uh, on Meaning it would be worse than what they said? The trans no, it would be less. Mm -hmm. I mean, com compared to transportation, it's oh, not that much 40% higher than transportation. Gotcha. Because they didn't do the same accounting for the transportation sound I see. side. Uh, but from uh, life, I work with life cycle assessment, which is a way of uh, um, assessing the environmental impacts from farm to fork, basically. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at it from a farm to fork uh, assessment, our food system, total food system, not just agriculture, probably contributes to about 30% of the global impacts from all sectors. Uh, and uh, on the agricultural side, it's, uh, they say it's about 20%. It depends on how you account for it again. Uh, the big thing is we know that right now 30% of the Earth's surface is dedicated to meat production, either through pasture or through grain growth. 30%? 30% of the Earth's surface. And 10% is for other, other food. So 30% of the Earth's surface right now is meat production. Does that feel like a lot to you? Uh, I think it feels like a lot because, as I mentioned before, those limits that we were talking about, mm -hmm. that they said we're at a dangerous limit for the amount of land we can change over, uh, we can't really exceed that. So we certainly have to produce future food within you know, what we already are using in terms of land. Fun. I wonder if you could come back in on that and talk about your view of the impact of animal agriculture as it relates to climate change. Yeah, so I think it goes back to um, those complexities. So um, here in Canada, we say that, uh, or the numbers are that um, the greenhouse gas footprint of agriculture is around 8%, about 50% of that comes from, um, from livestock, and about 50% of that comes from um, you know, beef and, and dairy. And so as we're um, looking at making improvements in Canada and globally, there's lots of shared practices that can be utilized. So um, Canada's green greenhouse gas footprint for beef production per kilogram of live weight is about 50% of the world average. And so um, there's lots of improvements that can be made. And I, I think it also goes to speaking about um, the integrated landscape. So um, at the Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, we have a number of environmental organizations who are very keen on working with beef producers because of the grasslands that beef producers are um, helping conserve. So that offers a huge amount of biodiversity within the agricultural landscape, which certainly leads to resiliency uh, in the agricultural landscape. And it is an enormous store of carbon. So about 1.5 billion tons of carbon are stored in, um, in lands that are used by beef production. So I think, again, it just goes back to um, how do we make sure that there are resilient systems in place that work together that are appropriate for that place that supply the amount of um, food that we that we are going to need to need to produce. Ben, I want to circle back with you on something you said a few moments ago, which was, and you'll help me make the comparison again. Uh, in Canada versus Brazil, yeah, so we got twice the output so, with half the land. Yeah, so if we look at the amount of beef produced per cow or per mama cow, uh, in the in, in Canada, we're able to produce 270 kilograms per cow. And in places like Brazil, for example, they're only, able, they're only able to produce around 130 kilograms of beef per mama cow. How come? Uh, it's just a, a much more efficient system. So uh, we're able to utilize feedlots. We're able to utilize technologies like hormonal implants, uh, feed additives that improve efficiency. So it's just a, a, a much more efficient type of a system. And a lot of these efficiencies um, we're, we're just kind of really starting to get into, uh, to, into all of their, their uses and, and fully understand what we're able to, to use these for. And I think in the next 20 to 30, 40 years, I think that uh, beef farmers and the beef industry as a whole will be taxed to, uh, to adopt a lot of these growth promoting technologies. And I think that that'll really help improve the efficiency of the entire system. Well, Bruce, maybe I'm reading between the lines here, but the suggestion seems to be that 
we may not have to take the kind of dramatic uh, action uh, that you and others suggest because we're getting pretty good at this. That's the suggestion. Anyway, what do you say? Well, I was listening to Fawn, and I thought we were going to come to um, some degree of agreement. There is a capacity for regenerative use of especially cattle. So cattle can be farmed, um, cattle that can be raised in a way uh, that is significantly less harmful to the environment. But for pigs and chickens, you're talking about 100% of the systems that are used for pigs and chickens involve what I was talking about earlier. They're literally using land that could otherwise be productive for human purposes, and they're growing 10 to 15 times as many crops as they would need to grow if they were feeding it to human beings, and they're feeding that to farm animals, a grossly inefficient system. Uh, but then I heard Ben talking about added hormones and feedlots, and I think most people, probably including fawn, want to move away from growth promoting hormones and feedlots. Uh, that strikes me as absolutely not the right way to go. But at the end of the day, you really do come up against the fact that animals, if you're going to raise them in order to eat them, with the exception of regenerative farming with beef cattle, if you're gonna raise them in order to eat them, that is going to be a grossly inefficient system by comparison to eating plants directly. Ben, you had a bit of a wince there when he said that. You wanna come back? Yeah, so um, I, I think we're kind of taxed with uh, improving efficiency and also uh, consumer uh, acceptability and those type of things. And that's something as, a, as an industry and a meat industry, I think it's something we don't do a, a, a well enough job of is, uh, is explaining what these technologies are able to do. And I don't think we're really giving the, given the opportunity to in a lot of cases. Well, you got an opportunity here. Yeah, so exactly. So, do it. so this will be a great opportunity. <laughs> okay, do it. So we use these, uh, these growth promoting technologies uh, they go through millions of dollars of testing. Uh, some of these products take, up, take decades to, uh, to, to, uh, to be approved by um, the, the government systems. And, uh, and they're, they're proven to be safe for human consumption. They're proven to, uh, to not affect consumer acceptability or taste or flavor, or all of those type of things negatively. And they're really uh, products that are underutilized in the industry and most of that underutilization comes from consumer pushback. And uh, just so I'm clear, the, the cows get fatter, tastier, faster. Is that right? Yeah, so it just makes the whole system more efficient. And it's something that uh, a lot of consumers don't fully understand. Uh, we think that we're adding hormones to what's on our plate, and that's not really what happens at all. That really couldn't be further from the truth. Let me see if Mike's going to sign on to that. How much of that? Well, it, 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 I, I, th I think what Ben is saying is accurate. It, it, there are the, these technologies are safe. That doesn't mean uh, consumers have the right to choose whatever they want to choose. And I, and I think that uh, we are seeing increasingly consumers are saying we're not sure about those technologies. So we do have an opportunity to say here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, as we do with any product. Uh, and if the consumer says no, then the consumer says no, and, and we have to think. I think the, the, tr the, the truth to a significant degree is consumers are going to drive many of these changes anyway. We're seeing, uh, you know, we've seen meat, product, meat consumption go down as we, you know, in, in North America generally as we age, uh, we're eating less, we're eating smaller portions, we're, we're, we're exploring more alternatives. Um, and, and I think those alternatives will continue to grow. Do I think beef is going to go away. I hope not. I'm a particular fan of beef, but but I think that our consumption patterns are that our consumption patterns are are definitely going to change. I'm going to show some charts on that in just a second, but Fawn, I heard you trying to get in, so go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say that I think um, no matter the production system that you're using, it's going to be really important that we're looking at all of the research and all of the innovations and all of the best practices from each of those different production systems as we're going forward trying to grow food for 9 billion people. So whether you're looking at an organic system, sort of a conventional system, a grass-fed system, a hormone-free or one that utilizes that type of uh, technology that is approved, um, what we're going to need 
need to do is really use the best from everybody because we have a big challenge in front of us and um, it's just it's going to be so important that we're utilizing everything and that we're having that very uh, a very strong dialogue with consumers um, to help them understand um, agriculture as it moves forward something that we talk about in the agriculture industry is that um, people today are about three generations removed from the farm so three generations ago everybody had an aunt and an uncle or a grandma and grandpa who is on the farm and and now we talk about people being three generations removed and so making sure that there's a space where we can have a conversation about agriculture practices that we're connecting the farmer to the chef to the consumer um, and that we're we're continually making improvements in our agriculture and our food systems uh, is going to be very important okay to that end and I want to pick up on what you said about meat consumption because we got a couple of charts on that and then we'll have a go around on that uh, control room, if you would. This is the, as we're calling it, the meatification of diets. And this is per capita meat consumption over the last 50 years nearly. And, you know, as we can see, the United States is well up there. A little dip at the end there, as Mike referred to. A little dip, a little less consumption happening per capita. But still, Americans by far uh, consume more meat in their diets than in any other parts of the world. Canada isn't on this chart, but we're just uh, up there almost where the Americans are, a little bit below. China, you see the direction that red line is taking. It is moving up, but it's still well below where the United States is. You see the world average below that. Africa and South Asia, uh, which have much less meat in their diets for a whole variety of reasons, uh, near the bottom of the chart. However, if you want to look at to total global meat consumption by ton, why do Canadian farmers want to get into China so badly? Well, that's why. Look at the arc on that red line. China is a huge market for meat consumption uh, for farmers all over the world and you see how the rest of it goes from the USA and Canada to Western Europe to Brazil which Ben mentioned earlier Africa and South Asia is there uh, Gretty let me start with you on this well no let me think okay Bruce I'm gonna go to you stand by we'll come back to you in a second Bruce to you first on this one as the world gets richer and as all boats rise is there any reason to assume that meat won't be an increasingly important part of the diets of people in these developing countries, as has been the case throughout history. Yeah, well, I, I definitely think that we in the first world, um, in the developed world, are not in a position to sort of point fingers at China or the emerging markets and to tell them how they should eat. Um, if we're eating an astronomical amount of meat, we're not really in a great position to point fingers at other countries. And that's why at the Good Food Institute, what we're focused on is using markets and using food technology to promote the products that people will actually choose. So we're focused on using behavioral economics. And this is what Eric Schmidt was talking about when he was talking about plant-based meat. This is why Bill Gates is invested in plant-based meat companies, because he wants to impact climate change in a positive way. So um, we can argue about the gross global numbers on climate change, but on a per meal basis, if you want to supply somebody with a protein calorie from legumes like soy or pea or garbanzo beans, that is going to be 40 times fewer CO2 equivalent calories when you're comparing that to the most efficient meat, which is chicken. So it's about 40 times as much climate change on a per protein calorie basis from meat as opposed to legumes. And that's one of the reasons we need to be producing the alternatives that people actually want to consume. And there are some pretty exciting companies that are focused on precisely that. And a lot of excitement among Bay Area, among Silicon Valley entrepreneurs for these sorts of companies. In North America, Goretti, do we have too much meat protein in our diets in your view? Yes, we do. Uh, there's uh, evidence, first of all, for, uh, on average, I think it's 40 kilograms per person per year that people consume uh, on, in glo globally. And in Canada, we consume more than double that. In the U.S., as you saw, it's probably about triple the average. Uh, I did, uh, we did do some research on Ontario diets. We looked at 10,000 uh, residents and their consumption of food about, from about 10 years ago. And uh, we, when we looked at the protein, we were twice the level of what we actually need or is recommended by Canada's Food Guide. So we have too much protein in our diets. Why for do sure. we do that? Because uh, it's cheap. It tastes good and we like it. It tastes good. <laughs> There's a perception that humans are meant to eat meat. And in Australia, they did a study, and especially men, they said we're supposed to eat meat. Uh, there's uh, cultural, it's very, culture is very important because in Canada, as we've been saying, like we, we have different types of land and land uses and in a cold climate, 
Uh, you can't grow a lot of other things. So if you're growing pasture and grass, it makes a lot of sense to have uh, beef animals. And it's the same thing for other northern countries. And so it makes sense that we're eating more, uh, more beef because that's what's available Except to us. Except Mike's not going to give up his beef. Mike likes his meat. I do, I do like and my I don't, meat. But, I don't but, know if you need but, to. But, but Steve, I eat less than I used to. Yes. You know, I, I, eat, uh, I eat less beef than I used to. Uh, my wife tells me I should eat less red meat. I tell her the, the, the research says mostly that's related to processed meat, not to, 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 uh, to, to, the, to the basic cuts. But I think we're all eating less meat. I'm also getting older, unfortunately. All of those sorts of things are happening. The truth is that we are eating too much of everything in mm. North America, not just, uh, not just protein, not just meat. Uh, we, we tend to, as Greti said, because it's cheap, uh, because it's easy, uh, because it's convenient, uh, culturally, all of those sorts of things. That said, uh, what I think, uh, what, what I think we're hearing is, is we're we need to diversify that diet, right? And and so uh, we will likely not be able to produce meat so that everyone in all of the world will be able to eat as much meat as we as we do in North America. Mm -hmm. And so as there are alternatives around, some of these plant based uh, plant based proteins, plant based meats. We I, th I think he was referring to. Uh, some of these products where we're actually replicating the meat experience uh, with vegetable-based or, or, or plant-based uh, ingredients. I think there's lots of opportunity to diversify. There's lots of opportunity to, to eat less, uh, I think particularly for North Americans, and, and exploring those options. I think we're, what we're seeing in the North American diet is uh, people exploring a wider range. And, and we're spending an increasingly large proportion of our food dollar outside the home. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, we'd go to a restaurant and have, you know, steak and potatoes and, and, you know, you'd go to a good steakhouse. Now restaurants are trying to do something because we all watch the Food Network and, and, and uh, our restaurants are trying to give us an experience that's different. So we're eating different types of proteins, plant-based proteins, all sorts of different things. Well, let me check that out with Fun because I got a feeling she's taking a dim view of the fact that many people around this table, literal and metaphorical, want us to have less meat. What do you say on that, Fun? Well, I think that it's certainly uh, a goal and something that has to do with a sustainable agriculture system is making sure that people have access to food that is nutritious and that is balanced to them. But do you so want us having less meat? meat? That, so that meat can can be a portion of the plate, I think, is, is a good conversation and making sure that people are, are eating within the recommended, um, re recommended food guides. Okay, but that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come at this again. Would, do, you, do you and those you represent, do you take a dim view of those who want all of us to eat less meat? I think that what we need to make sure is that people are getting the right amount of nutrition and that we're wasting less food. So I think that that is a goal that we can that we can all share. Okay, can you can you share the goal of cutting our meat consumption in half, all of us collectively? You know, I think that that has to do um, with a number of different factors, and I don't think it's quite as simple as saying, you know, cut meat production or meat consumption by half and increase, um, you know, broccoli consumption by three. That's, that's, I don't think, that, I think that's oversimplifying the conversation uh, too much. Okay, Bruce, I want you to tell us what lab meat is, because I, I'm going to follow that up with a question about whether we need to do more of that. So start by telling us what it is. Um, sure. Let me just uh, step back one, one, just take one step back, though, um, and point out that Goretti was talking about the need to go from 80-20 animal-based to plant-based to 20-80 plant-based animal-based, which I think is a noble goal and something worth striving for. And if we're going to do that, we're probably not going to do it by simply educating people about the environmental harm or the food insecurity or animal welfare or whatever else. We're really going to have to produce the products that compete with animal products on the basis of taste and price and convenience. And plant-based meat is designed to do that. And so too clean meat, which is sometimes called lab-grown meat. But of course, all food that's processed starts in a food lab. So we're calling it clean meat instead of lab-grown meat, both because it is exponentially more efficient, it causes 95% less greenhouse gases, requires a fraction of the land and water. So sort of like clean energy, it's a far more efficient and less polluting product. It's also simply cleaner. 
uh, whether you're talking about organic agriculture or conventional ag agriculture, the farm and the slaughterhouse lead to a lot of bacteria. And if you're going with what Ben's talking about, there actually is evidence that the hormones and the other antibiotics and things that are fed to the animal, that can end up in the flesh as well. So clean meat, meat produced through modern cell growth and multiplication techniques, you basically feed the nutrients to the cells directly rather than feeding the animal and causing the animal to grow. It's called clean meat and it ends up being produced in something that looks an awful lot like a brewery. So total transparency, a clean product, a natural product, and a significantly more sustainable product. They're, they're champing at the bit to get in here, but one fast uh, follow up here. Just as there's really no such thing as clean coal, even though some people want to call it that, is there any such thing truly as clean meat, Bruce? Well, the production practices are about three times more efficient than chicken and cause 95% fewer greenhouse gases. So maybe it's not quite as good as plant-based meat, but it's awfully close. And you think about the processes that Ben is talking about, the hormones that he wants to feed the beef cattle, the feedlots that he wants to put them in, like that is an unnatural process. There's very little about modern factory farms and slaughterhouses that is natural. And when you have two products and one of them is produced and it looks like a brewery, and the other one is produced in the way that you know, modern farms and slaughterhouses operate, people eat meat right now despite how it's produced. They don't wanna think about the farm, they don't want to think about the slaughterhouse. When they can think about how it's produced and it's live streamed on video, um, I think we see a lot of people shifting. We're going to go Ben, then Mike. Okay, well, I mean, we'll, we'll kind of go through that and, and, and try to dissect some of the, the, all of the facts that were thrown at us there. And uh, well, well, first off, lab-grown meat is not commercially available now, so it, it'd be very difficult to, uh, to make all those claims of how much more efficient and all of those type of things it is. But... Uh, We'll focus on uh, just one little aspect of the, of the meat industry that, that was mentioned there. So the meat industry, if we, if we talk about lab-grown meat or clean meat replacing uh, livestock or meat from animals, it's something that uh, it sounds really good in theory, but if we think about all of the other things coming from the meat industry as byproducts, as uh, as all of those type of things, both edible and non-edible byproducts, we, we really get the full value of the meat industry. So whenever we think of uh, of leather, of, uh, of of all the all the different uh, the things that use the, the gelatin from these carcasses that we were able to uh, obtain from the meat industry, the, the, we really see the whole scale of it. It's something that, uh, to just be qu quite honest, it's not something that will ever be able to be fully replaced. By, by this clean meat Can I ask you industry. This? Have you ever eaten clean meat? Um, I, I have not. I think it's really, really hard to come by these days. Um, I was looking at some figures that, uh, that, that I saw because I like to try to keep up on the, the new, uh, new, new inter interventions and that type of thing in the food industry. And I think currently a pound of, of clean meat costs around $18,000 to produce. And I'm sure that over the next 10 or 20 years, they'll get much better at replicating it and able to scale up and all of those type of things. But Eighteen thousand for a pound of clean meat compared yeah, to that, compared to compared to uh, what, what a pound of chicken is yeah. three dollars. Well, how about a pound, a pound of steak? Well, what, what? About five to six dollars. Okay, so uh, <laughs> on price point, we're not well, quite there yeah, yet. Yeah, and we're just not quite there yet with right. the clean okay. meat industry. And it, it's something that in the future they're going to have to be able to scale up, be able to to replicate uh, in mass production those type of things. Okay, Bruce, come on back into that, and then Mike goes. Yeah, so there's a company called Memphis Meats, which you can find online at just memphismeats.com or you can Google them. Um, and it's true that clean meat production is expensive now, but remember that the first iPhone cost $3.4 billion. <laughs> this is a more efficient process and the people who are leading the way in this process, a former Harvard Medical School professor named Mark Post and a former University of Minnesota Medical School professor named Uma Valetti, these are the two sort of pioneers of this technology, and they're both saying that it will be commercially available in about five years and it will be cost competitive with conventional chicken in about 10 years. It's the exact same product, but far more efficient um, far less likely to be contaminated with lethal ba bacteria, and just all around, it's a better product, and the price will come down. It's expensive now because it's in developmental stages. Mike, over to you. So I was going to jump in and, and, and refer back to what Bruce said about we have to provide products that are both price competitive and, and are similar. 
And so, uh, yes, it's very expensive now. Uh, eventually, I expect we will get it to be, uh, to be less expensive. Uh, we have to consider a little bit how the consumer is going to respond. Consumers haven't always responded remarkably well to technology, food technology. Uh, and so there is some question as to how, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons we're calling it clean because we're a little bit worried about how people are going to say lab-grown meat. You know, it doesn't sound quite as appetizing. It doesn't, doesn't sound quite as appetizing. The other, the other thing that, that and, and again, this is what Bruce said, it has to be a similar product. When you grow meat in a lab, or clean meat, let me go away from the lab, uh, you're not growing a muscle. And so what you're, what you're doing is you're creating a protein source, uh, which is much more like a ground product than, than a steak. So, so for some of the hardcores that, that, that don't want to give a, get rid, go away from that texture, uh, we're not at a place yet where we're going to be able to do that. What we're doing is we're providing another alternative to, to broaden, uh, the, broaden the sources of protein, uh, reduce, uh, as Goretti said, reduce the, uh, the climate impacts of, uh, of our meat production, of our protein production overall, and to meet these growing needs. Okay, so so it's not going to be, it's not gonna be a, a, a perfect answer. It's not a perfect substitute. But if we can get there commercially, even in the early stages, there'll be some novelty around it. And, and, and even if it's not as well, cheap, some people will eat it just because it's new and different. Uh, well, that's the last question I got. I got 20 seconds, Bruce, to you. Have you ever eaten it? And if you have, what does it taste like? Um, I have eaten it. And because it is chicken and is duck and is beef, it tastes like chicken, duck, and beef. It tastes exactly <laughs> the same because it is exactly the same product. Gotcha. OK, that's Bruce Friedrich from the Good Food Institute in Washington, DC, Fawn Jackson out of our Calgary studio from the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And back here in our studio in Toronto, we are delighted to offer thanks to Goretti Diaz at the University of Waterloo, to Mike Von Masso at the University of Guelph, Ben Boyer, whose name is spelled Borer, but pronounces it <laughs> Boyer. Still trying to figure that one out. Also from the University of Guelph, good to have you all on TVO tonight. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.